Greetings, everybody. Welcome to our current episode of the Climax Seminar Series. My name is Athanasios Nenes. I'm a professor at EPFL, and I will be your, the moderator for today's uh, uh, seminar series. The Climax uh, Seminar Series, How to Move Forward and Act on Climate Change, is an interactive online event that takes place twice a month, every second Monday during lunch break, with two new speakers. And each episode aims to strengthen the dialogue and collaboration between Neil and EPFL scientists, Swiss politicians, entrepreneurs, and various stakeholders from the broader community. Uh, this seminar series takes place within the context of the newly established Climax Center, and it's one of the pillars. So we are very excited to have both our speakers and the whole communities of EPFL and Neil together in this, in this venue. Participants are to take uh, place, are welcome to take place uh, in discussion, both in English or French. So please feel free to use your language of preference. And uh, we have uh, uh, the pleasure and honor to welcome two speakers today. Our first speaker is Bettina Schaefli, who is professor and head of the hydrology unit at the Institute of Geography at the University of Bern. And our second speaker is Nada Peleg, who is an Excellenza Assistant Professor at the Faculty of Geosciences and Environment at the University of Lausanne. And uh, just a few notes about uh, the episode. Again, the discussion will, each presenter will present their material within the first 20 minutes, and there will be 10 minutes of discussion following that. And after that, uh, uh, Nada Peleg will uh, pr uh, present his presentation following the presentation of Bettina Sheffley. And again, it will be 20 minutes followed by 10 minutes of discussion and questions. A few comments about uh, the logistics. Again, please mute your microphone and turn off your video. Unless if you're speaking, we do not tolerate harassment. So please refrain from using you know, inappropriate comments. Uh, and if there's anyone that is uh, you know, proceeding in harassing behavior, please let us know so that we can deal with that. The seminars are recorded and will be posted online, so please keep that in mind. And to ask questions, either write them in the chat as the speaker speaks, or when at the end, please raise your hand so we can uh, address you through the microphone. And with that, I'd like to uh, welcome our first speaker for the today. Let me just stop sharing. So Bettina, whenever you're ready, please go ahead and share your screen and we're looking forward to hearing your exciting results and discussion. So thank you very much. And uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here today in this uh, seminar series. So as mentioned before, I'm a professor of hydrology at University of Bern, uh, but I also have very close collaboration with UNIL where I still have uh, two PhD students at the moment. So I'm going to talk about water resources in Switzerland today. And uh, if we... Okay, so the first, the introduction to this talk, I would like to give you an overview of what we actually know today about the evolution of uh, Swiss water resources. Uh, there has been this huge project funded by the Swiss Federal Office on the Environment called Hydro CH 2018, which has worked on giving uh, the most recent overview of how Swiss water resources are going to evolve taking into account the latest climate change scenarios to, which are called uh, the Swiss scenarios 2018. And now we certainly know, have very good idea of where our water resources, especially in terms of stream flow are going to evolve to in the future. Here we have some of the key results that are summarized in several reports, papers and leaflets for uh, stakeholders. And just a quick look on two key results. One thing is certainly that given that uh, due to warming, snowfall is going to decrease, we have a considerable increase of winter stream flow, which simply results from the fact that uh, rainfall is going to end up more quickly in stream flow than would snowfall, which is stored during site and while. As a result of that, summer stream flow is going to decrease, simply because in many high elevation catchments, the lack of snow accumulation will be then noticeable during the subsequent summer. And in addition, we have the all, all projections 
agree that summer precipitation is most likely to decrease. So as a result, we will have a reduction in summer runoff. Now, in addition to what we today know about future stream flow, there is now well-known results about how the glacier cover is going to evolve. So here are the key numbers from the last Swiss glacier inventory, 2010, when the Switzerland had about a 2.5 glacier coverage. And during the 30 years between 1980 and 2010, the Swiss glaciers lost about 0.6 meters per year in terms of annual mass loss. So over the 30 years uh, of the observation period, that would correspond to 22.5 cubic um, kilometers, which uh, is roughly between a quarter and a third of Lake Geneva. So very considerable loss of stored water. Now, of course, more interesting than just knowing numbers about stream flow and glaciers is the question of what actual impacts that would have on water resources. So one of the areas that has probably the best been quantified in the past is hydropower. So here are two key results from two different studies, one about runoff river hydropower production, so hydropower produced just along a river without an accumulation reservoir. And we studied 21 hydropower plants in Switzerland and came to the conclusion that by the mid and the end of the century, these runoff river hydropower plants would reduce their production in the order of magnitude of a few percent, depending on the climate change emission scenario. Now, on the other hand, we also started the question of how this would uh, affect hydropower production in reservoirs or in hydropower systems that use accumulation reservoirs. And there, we simply looked at the question of how much this production would re reduce due to the glacier mass loss. So today the glaciers are melting, so they give us a lot of water that we can use for hydropower production. And once many of them are gone, the hydropower production from this accumulation storage plants would reduce again in the order of a few percent. By the end of the century, we came to the conclusion that it might be in the order of 3%. Now, interestingly, back in 2018, these results, so the reduction of hydropower from glacier melt of a few percent, led to this uh, not very alarming headline, which was glacier melt has little impact on hydropower production. Today, I guess, I guess that many of you have followed the news about electricity shortage. And um, I'm convinced that nowadays the headlines would look different. So we had recently this intervention of uh, the federal government uh, to ask industries to start preparing to electricity shortages, especially during winter. Switzerland always has a lack of electricity production during winter and it's to import during winter. So that's a known problem, which is going to continue in the future. And just as a short side note, the question of how badly we are going to like suffer from electricity shortage is just about being studied now by different research group. My group at the moment is working on the question of how to quantify energy droughts, so situations when we do not produce enough energy. And as a starting point, uh, we work on the question of how energy droughts arise due to, uh, to the other renewables, so wind and sun. And here's just one typical result that which we could get at, which is here the energy droughts during winter and what would be the return period of such energy droughts in terms of duration and intensity uh, at the European scale. And we see here that, of course, winter energy droughts are very likely to occur regularly. Here we see extreme droughts that have a return period of three to four years, which means that they can occur really regularly. Now, in this context of a potential lack of water and energy, one of the key questions that we can ask us is whether reservoirs are going to save us. So here are some numbers. Swiss hydropower has actually currently a reservoir volume, so artificial reservoirs that corresponds to four cubic kilometers or nine terawatt hours. 
which is much higher than our neighboring countries like Germany or Austria. And in addition, we of course not only have these <coughs> reservoirs, but we also have <coughs> sorry, we also have lakes, natural lakes, of course, which are <coughs> illustrated on this map uh, in the work of a colleague, Manuela Bruno. So Manuela Bruno and her team they tried to have a look at uh, whether water reservoirs could alleviate water shortage. And in this context, we first should have a look at um, uh, who are actually the competitors for water in Switzerland. So that's a representation of the current water demand. And we see that besides hydropower, we of course have ecology. That's, this represents all uh, residual flow related water uses. So water that we have to leave in the rivers that we cannot take out. Then we have um, irrigation, drinking water, cattle, technical snow, industry and tourism. So we see these, all these competitors actually would like to use water. <laughs> and the result of the study is that indeed, we are in a situation today and in the future where we are going to face local water shortages, especially during summer. Here, one of the results of uh, Manuela Bruno's studies, where we see here now indicated in terms of millimeters per day, that's a unit that hydrologists like to use. So it's the equivalent of water in, uh, on, the, on the area of these catchments that we see here that would be lacking. And you see that today in the Alps, the area where there's a lot of water, there will be always a surplus. But already today in the average situation, we have catchments areas where there might be shortage of water on an average basis. And on the right side here, we see the, how much water could be lacking once every 10 years during summer in the Swiss plateau. And we see here now that the colors really get very brownish or yellow brownish, and that this indicates that there will be widespread shortage, shortage all over the Swiss plateau. Now in the past or until recently, when I used to talk about climate change and water resources, I would have regularly said something like is quoted here, we have sufficient quantitative evidence for climate change adaptation. Meaning that we basically know now what is going to happen and we just have to convey it to the stakeholders. But in fact, in the recent, like say one or two years, I noticed several points of elements that are really missing. So first of all, we always have to be, we really have to keep in mind that we still need good knowledge about extremes. And NADAF is going to talk about extremes in future cities, but we really have to know that whatever we see about climate change impact results in Switzerland, the knowledge about extremes is really still very small, simply because the current scenarios do not include any predictions about uh, sub-daily precipitation extremes in the future. Then when I talk about climate change impact prediction, I usually like to present it in terms of, you know, we need a good theory to understand how nature works. We need the mathematical tools to encode nature in equations. And we need, of course, the data to drive our <coughs> mathematical tools. And usually I tend to say, well, you know, we still have to go forward in theory development and in the mathematical, mathematical tools, but we tend to forget that on the data side, there is still a big lack. Now, what you see here is uh, the so-called, what I would call the baseline uncertainty. We usually present like the Swiss water cycle in numbers, like you can see here, that's one typical representation where we have some numbers on precipitation, evaporation, on soil and groundwater, on total stream flow. But what we hide is that the uncertainty behind these numbers is really huge. Precipitation is hard to observe. We don't have that many stations at high elevation. Snow is difficult to measure. We have maybe a good idea of ice melt. That's pretty well observed in Switzerland. Evaporation and transpiration, we still have a huge way to go. And looking below the ground remains difficult. 
And, and that's perhaps more surprising, there is a considerable uncertainty about current water use. So I got aware of that only recently through my collaborations with agriculture. So just these key numbers, industry and agriculture are our largest water users. The origin of their water is only about 20% public. 8% is private extraction. The pri private water extraction altogether represents 50% of all used water. It's often not metered. There are no statistics. In particular, we have no idea how much water is used in Swiss agriculture for irrigation. This, of course, can easily be changed. It's just a question of imposing the monitoring of water use in all sectors, but it's not done today. So to conclude, that's like the classical view that we hydrologists and water managers have on how we should approach the question of future water resources. We have to focus on water use, on water protection, and the protection against water in terms of extremes. But in fact, this view is really limiting because whatever we do in the field of water resources has an impact on our land and on the energy production. So the three natural resources of Switzerland can actually not be considered separately. We need to really work and assess the three of them jointly to protect biodiversity, to protect our cultivated land, our high quality land against buildings at locations where they're not appropriate, for example. We have to protect the subsurface. That's really key in the context of producing more and more energy using the subsurface. Of course, in the context of uh, climate change, another key question is also the protection of the landscape related to wind and solar power. And so in my view, one of the most important steps for people like me who work on climate change impact prediction is to really overcome these classical sector, sectorial impact predictions and to try to come up with change predictions that include all resources dimensions. So thank you very much. So thank you very much. My name is Nadav Beleg and I am a new Excellenza Professor at the University of Lausanne. And I will talk today about how, how climate change and urbanization will affect the uh, floods in future cities. And the reason that I put uh, actually a question mark at the end of this title is, as you will see in the next slide, uh, that we have I guess still more questions than answers. So let's start talking about uh, urban flooding. So urban flooding is a global phenomenon. We see uh, cities, uh, large and small, flooded in dry and wet climates, uh, both in developed and uh, developing countries. And if we look at the um, trends, both in the uh, frequency and actually also in the magnitude of floods or in the damage cost, we will uh, clearly see a rapid increasing trends. And these trends are actually even foreseen to become um, worse in the future. So floods are, become, are foreseen to become more frequent. And the question um, maybe that can be asked at the beginning that is, why is that? Well, there are several different factors that are actually responsible to this um, enhancement in uh, floods in the future. The first and maybe the most trivial one is the urbanization. Uh, we can clearly see that um, the change from the early 90s to today where uh, more than 2 billion people moved to uh, be settled in cities. In addition to the increase in the number of uh, people that are actually settled in cities, that is, of course, foreseen to further increase in the future, cities are also becoming larger and denser. You can uh, clearly see that by looking uh, at the number, increase in the number of mega cities. Now, it is quite clear that if cities are becoming uh, larger and denser, then there is more built area that is exposed to uh, floods. So hence the increase in the uh, potential damages. But also we change the natural uh, catchments uh, to be more uh, cemented, for example. So we have less infiltration and more potential for, run for a rainfall to be converted into runoff. Second factor that uh, we need to consider is, of course, climate change. Uh, there are, 
I would say not hundreds, but thousands of ore dealing with uh, the uh, effect of climate change on intensification of rainfall. I think now it is very um, clear that there are some processes like an increase in convection depth and increase in updraft that are being classified as very likely that uh, point on the intensification of extreme rainfall. In a study that we um, just recently published, um, we tried to look at this um, intensification of hourly rainfall extremes at more of a global scale. Uh, what we simply did is we tie between the intensification, the hourly um, scale of rainfall and uh, temperature. And you can see here uh, in the um, large landmasses in uh, North America and Europe, uh, for example, that we are anticipating an intensification in the range of uh, six to eight uh, percent per degree Celsius. So it is quite uh, easy to imagine that if we're talking about a three, four degree Celsius and increase, we're talking about intensification of hourly extreme rainfall in the order of more than 20%, that is quite a lot and may lead to an increase in floods. And the last factor uh, that I would like to mention today, there are of course many others, is the urban rainfall or the effect of urban areas on um, changes in the rainfall properties. Uh, I would say that looking at um, many different works uh, that were published in the literature, it is quite clear that urban area is affecting to uh, enhance rainfall uh, over the city and also downwind of the city. There is one paper that I can bring as an example um, illustrating this. This is the work of uh, Zange Tal that was published in Nature a few years ago. They actually tried to simulate, um, not try, they simulated uh, the uh, uh, Hurricane Harvey hitting the um, city of Houston. So here what you uh, see, is the changes between a five day uh, accumulated rainfall with um, a simulation done by climate model taking into consideration the city and another simulation that is identical in all aspects, but uh, the fact that the city was replaced with the natural condition. And you can clearly see how the city act to uh, enhance rainfall intensities. Now, there are uh, several different factors in the city that are responsible for this rainfall intensification that are quite well studied. For example, the high-rise building that can contribute to uh, local updraft or the urban heat island uh, that can um, allow more um, humidity in the atmospheric column over cities, those enhancing uh, the rainfall. Uh, and aerosols, it's a bit more debatable here, but there are plenty of work that are suggesting that the increase of aerosol can lead to more uh, CCNs and more um, droplets of rainfall. What is yet not so clear is how urban areas are affecting the space, uh, time, and especially sp the spatial structure actually of rainfall. And to explain what I mean by that, I would like to give a very simple illustration example here. So let's assume we have a rain field, a rainfall field over an urban area. And we would like to see how the same rainfall field will look like moving over the city. So one option is that we will have an intensification that will be uh, homogeneous uh, over the entire rain field. But this is uh, not the only option that we can see. Second option is that we will have the peak rainfall intensities uh, intensifying on the expense of the low rainfall intensity around. So basically the whole field is intensifying, but we have if you would like to think about it this way, a redistribution of the uh, humidity toward the peak rainfall. And of course, there is the other option that is exactly the opposite. And it's, I would say, very unlikely where the peak rainfall intensities will actually be suppressed. So the decline in a bit uh, and the um, low intensity rainfall will intensify. So we would like to understand not only how different urban areas are affecting the spatial structure of rainfall, but also why in order to be able to explore, for example, several cities and generalize it uh, to others. In order to explain a bit how we do this flood assessment, which is basically um, dependent on modeling and to exemplify the um, 
importance of the changes to the spatial structure on flood assessment, uh, I would like to introduce the chain of modeling that we are following in the next slide. So what we can do, we can work with something that called the stochastic rainfall generator model. Uh, you can see an example to it here, the left uh, side. This rainfall generator is uh, basically simulating rain fields that evolve in space and time and try to mimic um, rain fields that observe from remote sensing devices as weather radar. Then we would like to take this rain field and feed it into a hydrodynamic model. Here you can see the city of Zurich. This is from a work that we recently done. This is the lake of Zurich. Uh, the train station is here, the old city is here. And you can see how flood is uh, evolving and actually flooding some parts of the old city in this specific uh, example. Okay, with this stochastic rainfall generator, we can of course play with uh, the structure of rainfall. Uh, we can have the same rain field in terms of total uh, volume uh, set in a relatively stratiform formation or a more convective uh, formation that actually bring more the hazards. So these are with more peak rainfall intensities. But we need to know how in the future we would like to change the special structure of rainfall. And to do that, we need another model to be involved. Uh, this is actually a climate model, a convection permitting model that is run at a very high uh, space time resolution. What you see here is an example to a composite uh, of uh, uh, extreme storms. Basically uh, think that you are following the same storm uh, from always for, uh, right above the peak of the storm, so from a Lagrangian perspective. And you can see how a composite of the storm may, might change from the present day to the future climate. Uh, we have the intensification of the uh, rainfall and an increase in the area, just follow one of the contours and you can see how the area is increasing between one image to the other. Maybe it's easier to see that uh, in this profile here to the side. So how we do this flood assessments? Um, generally speaking, we need information from convection permitting model that can be fed into a stochastic rainfall generator model that will allow us to generate an ensemble of uh, multiple extreme storms that will uh, differ uh, for example, by the intensity in the spatial structure. And of course, they can be fed into an hydrological model. So let me show you an, one example in which we try to um, see the importance of the spatial structure of the rainfall. What we did, we took the most extreme storm that was recorded in Switzerland by weather radar. So this is the heavy storm that hit uh, Lausanne in June, 2018, a Swiss record high of 41 millimeter in 10 minutes. We took this storm and we moved to uh, other cities, Geneva, Bern, and Zurich and Beninsona. Uh, I will just show some results from Zurich and uh, Bern in this example. And we did the following. We simulated uh, this rainfall ensemble one time, changing the spatial structure uh, of the storm and the intensities using convection perimeter model. And with two other a numerical experiment where we only change the intensities and kept the spatial structure unchanged. What you see here is actually the changes uh, in percent to the height of the water level uh, reaching the city uh, between the future and the present uh, storms. And you can clearly see that while there is a relatively good agreement with two different methods with rainfall uh, homogeneization intensification, uh, while we change the spatial structure of the rainfall, we see a considerably higher uh, impact. So this answer why it is important, but also why it is important to look at the spatial structure of rainfall, but also bring another question that we need to address. With this convection permitting model, we are only looking at the changes to the climate scenarios. We are not uh, embedding any changes to the urban scene, meaning urbanization is actually not taken into account. And there is a very practical reason why we are not doing that. This convection permitting model are very highly costly in terms of uh, the computational demand uh, requirement that they need and the time they need to be run. And having this multiple combination of uh, different climate scenarios and different uh, urbanization scenario together uh, in the same model is simply not feasible. That brings me to um, the project, the Excellenza project that uh, we just uh, started um, in last August, so three months ago. Uh, the project is about rainfall floods in future cities and it aimed to improve the ability to predict the magnitude and frequency of flood. 
We have several questions and just listed the, the three main questions here. The first one I just discussed, uh, how and why cities change space-time properties of rainfall. We would like to know that. Second question, uh, refer to the last slide I just show you. What role cities actually play in uh, climate changes, uh, meaning um, are cities uh, more important in their, uh, let's say, becoming, the, is the urbanization is a more important factor than climate change in enhancing or changing the rainfall? Uh, what is the joint effect of uh, both of them together and each separately that would like to explore? And the third question, which I will not get uh, into detail today, simply because uh, we do not have enough time for that, but of course I will be happy to discuss it later with the one who will be interested. How will compound climatic event change in future cities? So what we plan to do? First, uh, I would say obstacle, and this is also in line with what uh, Bettina presented before, is um, in terms of observation. Uh, we, um, I would say, like to think that we can use uh, something that is called local climate zones to understand the uh, variability of climate within city. Uh, in fact, I would claim that uh, we do not have enough uh, observations in cities in order to uh, understand the uh, micro uh, climate in cities and uh, the spatial variability. So we uh, plan to deploy a dense uh, climate sensor network, not climate um, station like the one plotted here, uh, which is expensive and difficult to maintain, but actually a small uh, acoustic sensor for uh, rainfall and uh, a very simple uh, temperature and relative humidity um, sensor that goes along with that. Uh, these are considerably uh, cheaper than the climate stations, uh, less accurate uh, naturally, but we plan to compensate this with having uh, dozens of them deployed in different cities for different summer, in different cities for several summer campaigns in order to understand the climate variability. Then uh, we plan to use remote sensing devices, uh, more precisely weather radar data, in order to understand how uh, these features or uh, uh, rainfall properties evolve in uh, space and time. Uh, we can do that using uh, image processing algorithm and uh, tracking method uh, that will be um, adjusted for the city uh, scale. Once we will have this information, uh, we will be able to um, link between the uh, changes to the rifle uh, properties and uh, the urban form and uh, try to do um, with modeling uh, some physical link that will also connect these changes with um, uh, local climate variability. The second question uh, about cities and climate change, uh, it's a pure modeling exercise. We plan to use the urban canopy model uh, in very high space-time resolution, uh, basically taking the city and uh, setting a gridded model over the city. With this climate model, um, because it will be in very high resolution, we do not plan to do a continuous simulation to the end of the century, but only focus on extreme rainfall event, specific one that um, will um, have from the observed uh, data. Uh, after evaluating this um, or setting the model for this specific uh, observed storm, we plan to use different climate and urban scenarios and the combination of them and do the partition uh, of uh, the contribution of each of these um, scenario to the changes in rainfall um, spatial structure. So I would say that the overall um, goal or what we would like to reach at the end is to be able not to take the climate scenarios and uh, urbanization scenarios separately, but I suggest some type of uh, parameterization that will include both of them that can be uh, in a way of um, a, a new stochastic uh, rainfall generator model that we develop explicitly for cities that will consider not only um, uh, the climate change, but also explicitly the changes to the urban form. Uh, it can be in a relation of scaling. So how uh, different uh, urban scenarios are linked to different climate variable. And between these two links, we can suggest a better parameterization 
uh, of the model of the intensification of uh, rainfall in the future, uh, or it can be using uh, machine learning that uh, we can try it for several different cities to as a training and have the machine learning um, hopefully work in a more global set. So of course we aim to do that for uh, the few selected cities that we will work in the context of this project, but at the end we would like to have a parameterization that can be generalized to any city to work with. So to conclude, um, I didn't plan to answer this question of how climate change urbanization will affect floods in future cities, but of course, we will be very happy uh, to have collaborators from UNIN and EPFL uh, that are interested to join this effort and answer um, as many questions as possible in this context in the next years. Uh, I would say that it's not um, only me, uh, or it's actually necessarily not me that will do most of the work, but my students. So I'm listing here the, the students' uh, tentative topics. Uh, some of the students are already here working, some will join in the next month. And uh, you are also more than welcome if you are interested in one of these specific, let's say, subtopics to contact one of the students directly. And with that, I would like to thank you and we'd be happy to answer any questions.